Hello and welcome everyone. We'll uh, give just a few minutes to allow our participants to enter. We have more than 350 registrants today, so very excited to see you all. Thank you for joining us. A Mentor Collective Partner Impact Story, working with the University of New Haven and Mentor Collective, retaining STEM students through high impact mentorship. So welcome everyone. Come on in, get settled. Uh, at our webinars, we do like that uh, if you can keep your camera on, your microphone is muted, but uh, we love to see the participants in the room. So if you're able, keep your camera on for us so we can get to know you better. Uh, I, I love Mentor Collective events because we do like to have those faces on the screen. Uh, it makes it more collegial and we can network a little bit and you can interact with others in the chat. All right. Again, welcome. I'm Michelle Burke. I'm a Partner Relations Director with Mentor Collective and very happy to welcome you here today. Uh, a Partner Impact Story with the University of New Haven and Mentor Collective, Retaining STEM Students Through High Impact Mentorship. And a guide to best practices on our web events. If you've not been to one of our web events before, we love to meet you. So again, uh, your audio is on mute, but please keep your camera on if you're able. But if you're not, enjoy your lunch, do whatever you need to do while this webinar is on. We are recording this today and we will pr be providing the recording to all of our registrants uh, sometime tomorrow. And uh, so you'll be able, if you miss anything, you'll be able to catch up on it uh, or you'll be able to share this uh, with others uh, on your campus or in your organization. Uh, if you would like to just see the speaker, you can adjust your video layout to speaker mode, speaker view, or if you want to see everyone, you can put it on gallery view, whatever your choice. And we love to meet you. So please chat your name, go to the chat box and put your name, your school or your organization. Please introduce yourself. We'd love to meet you and uh, network with you while you're here. And as we go along today, we love to have you uh, put any questions that you have in the chat box as well. Our agenda, we have a quick hour today. We're going to meet our colleagues from the University of New Haven, Tagliatella College of Engineering. We'll talk about the importance of belonging in STEM. Uh, we have great results to share from our mentorship program that we've been working on with the University of New Haven, and we'll share that program design and the results of the program. And we'll have questions, uh, time for questions at the end. Again, if you have questions as we're going along, please feel free to put those in the chat box. My colleagues, Austin and Jackie are monitoring that uh, the chat today and they'll either answer directly within the chat or we'll make sure that we make it part of our conversation before we conclude today. And I love to see some uh, emojis. So if you like what you hear, let us know with those reactions. Uh, you can take a look. If I think everybody knows Zoom by now, but if not, maybe you uh, don't know that in your toolbar there's a reactions button, and you have an ability to share a little emoji if you uh, if you like something. So if you don't mind indulging me, give me a little thumbs up. Show me that you're here today and participating. Would love to see some thumbs up from you. Thanks. I'm Michelle Burke. I'm a University Relations Partner Relations Director with Mentor Collective and Austin Krauss. Uh, you'll hear more from him later today, uh, Senior Partner Success Manager. And uh, I am based in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but I'm a Florida native. So my heart goes out today to our partners, friends, colleagues, family that are in the Southeast. Uh, just all of our uh, good wishes to you as you recover from Hurricane Ian and as it continues to kind of go up the coast. So all our thoughts are with you and um, to anybody from the Southeast, if you're able to join us today, uh, we wish you safety, health and safety in this time. Uh, want to introduce our partners. So happy to hear from them today. And I will let Ron, Stephanie and Nadia introduce yourselves. I'm gonna start with Ron. Hi, I'm uh, Ron harris -Shandon. I'm the Dean of the Tagliatella College of Engineering here at the University of New Haven, uh, and I have a dual role as uh, Vice Provost for Research. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Stephanie Gillespie. I serve as our Associate Dean for the Tagliatella College of Engineering, and I also do teach one of our first year engineering courses outside of my administrative responsibilities. Hi, everybody. My name is Nadia Adin. I'm an Associate Professor in the Mechanical Line Industrial Engineering Department. And many, many thanks to our panelists today and very happy that they wanted to share their good work and the work, uh, the impact that they've had on students. They actually presented much of this information in a paper uh, at a professional conference. And, and uh, so we're happy to share that information uh, to a wider, broader audience today. We love to start our web events to get you engaged and tell us more about what's happening on your campuses and how you work with students. We do have a poll if you don't mind giving us what are your biggest concerns right now in working with students. If you don't see the choice on the list here, please put uh, extra items in the chat and you can choose more than one. I, I, we're ask, asking for your biggest concern, but maybe you have more than a few big concerns right now in working with students. And it looks like retention is the big one. And that sense of belonging, understanding student barriers. Excellent. And you can see those results. I think Jackie has shared it with the whole group. Thank you. And what we love with what we're doing with Mentor Collective is that we actually address all of these concerns with the work that we do. And we'll share that with you today. So uh, for us at the University of New Haven, you know, one of our bigger concerns was on first year retention. Uh, and so that's what we're going to talk uh, mostly about today, although we have two programs, uh, both the first year program and a career program. Uh, the University of New Haven is a medium sized uh, university uh, classified as a large master's guarding university by the Carnegie classification. Our student numbers are up this year because of a surge in graduate enrollment. I think we are over 8,000 students now, uh, organized into five colleges and schools. Um, and uh, we are a suburban university. Our diversity ratios of students is quite high. We have a lot of first year, um, I mean, uh, first time students, as well as students who are uh, from diverse backgrounds, African-American, Latin, Latinx, and so on. Now, the College of Engineering uh, is, uh, and again, a little bit on the smaller side within the university, but again, our numbers have grown. We have about 600 undergraduate students and about 1,400 uh, master's uh, students uh, and a handful of PhD students as well. So that's uh, about 2,000 students overall. Uh, and despite uh, being smaller in size, we do have a full slate of uh, engineering and computer science and cybersecurity programs, both at the undergraduate and the graduate levels. Mm -hmm. uh, our work on uh, DEI has been recognized through a bronze level uh, recognition by the American Society of Engineering Education, uh, which has a diversity recognition program that you can apply for. Uh, and uh, so we have been recognized uh, among several uh, schools uh, in that category, in that list. Thank you, Ron, and congratulations on that work uh, for what you're able to do for your students. And I see in the chat, there's much interest in retention of STEM students uh, in those fields. And that's a good segue to this next question for Stephanie. Uh, tell me about uh, the importance of that sense of belonging in STEM students. I think it's it's across the board for all students, but in particular for STEM, where does that sense of belonging come in? Thank you. So if anyone's familiar with some of the literature on recruitment and retention of students, we see that that sense of identity is an important part for the deciding factor for why some students from diverse backgrounds may or may not choose to enter an engineering field. But we also see that the first year retention is often impacted by that sense of identity as well. We care about this at a broader context, not just from our university context, because the industry needs these diverse backgrounds and students in it. We know that the workforce doesn't represent our current population 
population in the United States. And I believe many of the individuals on this call are trying to do our part to make sure that anyone who wants to be in that profession has the opportunity to do so. We do believe this is the opportunity to fuel and fill a gap that we see in the workforce and provide opportunities for strong careers and STEM placements with students who are able to make it through the program and are excited to contribute with those fields. I know we see a lot of individuals who go into the field of engineering in particular, they maybe feel like they don't belong and they choose to leave, whether that's along the career path or whether that's while they're in their college studies. So by trying to create that stronger sense of identity early on, we're more likely to see them make it through to graduation and hopefully stay through in their professional field as well. Thank you. When we work with our partners at Mentor Collective, we start with what outcomes do you want to achieve? Uh, what solution can we help? Uh, what, what problem can we help find a solution for and use mentorship as the catalyst? Uh, so how can we build and support that student yield, retention, sense of belonging, career readiness, all these things for our students with limited staff resources. So a question for Ron, uh, what, what were the reasons for collaboration and how did you come to choose Mentor Collective to work with for this program? Yes, so, uh, you know, our first year retention uh, has always been a little bit on the lower side. Uh, you know, it's not an uncommon problem uh, in engineering uh, and computer science. Uh, and I was really looking for a way to uh, improve that uh, statistic uh, or, you know, those numbers. Uh, and uh, so we knew uh, that trying to launch, uh, you know, a, a built at home program would probably not be comprehensive and would not be able to reach uh, all of the students. We really wanted to impact as many students as we could. Uh, and the homegrown programs typically are unable to scale in that way. So I came across uh, Mentor Collective at uh, one of the engineering deans conferences. Uh, uh, and you know, once I learned about the platform uh, that they have, uh, that seemed like a, a good approach uh, to doing this uh, and to be able to scale it. So that really was the, uh, the beginning of this uh, about almost two and a half years ago. Wonderful. And capacity and scale, that is exactly what we're able to provide for our partners through mentorship programs. And I'm going to turn it over to Austin to describe that uh, program design process and, and how we choose what kind of mentorship to offer. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. And as Ron mentioned, we've, we've got a couple of different, different programs. And, and really, it starts with that, what's the ultimate goal of the program, right? So um, we'll be talking a lot about retention today, sort of focused on, on first year students, the, the main program we'll be talking about has incoming students coming in and really trying to connect them as soon as possible um, for the University of New Haven, as soon as they see themselves as a, as a charger, right, with an, an upper division student who can be that that buddy for them, that um, that connection um, to kind of work on that sense of belonging, right? There's another program as, as well, and this is where the two programs with two distinct goals come in, um, that's really focused on giving that opportunity to those upper division students. Um, maybe that mentor who was connected with, with a first year student now has a chance to, um, think about what would a career in engineering look like, right? What does um, the engineering field look like beyond the walls of the institution and be connected with somebody within industry or an alumni to have that conversation um, and to think about uh, what does it mean to think like an engineer? And we do that with the six essentials of a successful mentorship program. We start with that program design, then we go into a, a cadence of recruiting, training, matching, engagement, support, and assessment. Uh, these are the, the tools of our trade to bring mentorship to a large group of students on a campus. But mentorship isn't a new idea. It's not a novel idea. And um, Stephanie, you want to talk about how mentorship is used uh, in some of the literature review that you've done and, and uh, your knowledge of the profession. 
Yes. So mentorship comes in multiple different approaches. I know many of the universities here may have an informal mentorship program that's being run through student organizations on your campus, or potentially even you have peer success advisors or RAs or other roles. And we sort of view those as informal mentorship programs. We have sort of looked at formal mentorship programs as things that are running at a scale at the university and have a structured onboarding review. There's sort of metrics that you're trying to meet within this program. So the overall literature on this does span multiple different areas. When we were looking specifically at mentorship for engineering and computer science students in an academic setting, we do know that all mentorship can positively impact retention, but it, it does especially impact our female students and our minority students. But some of the other approaches to mentorship outside of what we're considering a mentorship program might look like summer bridge courses or even summer bridge programs that are more than just courses, first year or transition courses that have that built in peer support or on the career side, your capstone courses might have industry mentors involved with the project for both an industry perspective and for that mentorship perspective in some avenues. So it's not new. Our program does not live inside of a course structure. And I think that's really important to recognize that this is not running as an academic course. This is running as a program within our academic unit. And it's a great compliment to all the other activities that are going on for your students and, and working with your faculty and staff. And, and what Mentor Collective does with our partners is decide what is best for each campus, each partner. We're able to configure those programs to meet the needs of our partner and the customs of the campus. Uh, there's a great team behind this program at University of New Haven. Uh, you've met our panel and uh, I've been working on this program along with Austin for a little more than a year now, and uh, this is a wonderful team. They're all engaged in the program and what's happening, and I think that uh, is a testament to the great results that we get is because of that engagement with our partners. Uh, and then we have a team at Mentor Collective that is working on the nuts and bolts of mentorship, that behind the scenes, the algorithm for uh, authentic matching, monitoring uh, what's going on with each pair and making sure that there's engagement and uh, creating interventions with our partners to drive engagement of the participants in the program. So you'll see uh, Austin is, is our main partner facing person on the team. And then we have success operations managers that are behind the scenes like Chrissy Thomas, and they're more of the student facing and uh, mentor facing. So working with the actual participants in the program. And we do have a commitment to impact. Uh, our in-house research of the colleges and universities that we are involved with, and there's more than 150 programs across the country right now, uh, so many different partners, well, 7,000 programs across 150 different partnerships uh, over the years. And we've found that that sense of belonging, and we'll tell you how we measure that a little later, but we find an improvement in responses about sense of belonging uh, through the life of our mentorship programs. And we're also able to show uh, an impact on retention uh, when we compare students who are participating in mentorship versus students who are not. Mm -hmm. And we have another level of success that we look at, which is number of conversations. Uh, and a level of engagement with our participants. And we know that when there are more than three or more conversations between a, a pair, a mentor and a mentee, that there is a greater increase in that sense of belonging and a greater increase in retention among the students who engage uh, fully in the program. Well, there's a great question in, in the chat about um, whether or not uh, students are required or voluntarily participate within, within the program. Um, they do voluntarily participate. Um, and how exactly does that happen, right? We want to really lower the barrier to, to entry for students. So really, I spoke about as soon as they think about themselves as, as a charger in this case, we want to connect them with an, with an upper division student. Um, so reaching out to them um, early and often. Um, students uh, do have to go through a, a matching survey. It tells us a little bit about what they're looking for within that relationship, right? Am I looking for another um, in-state student who... Um, you know, likes to to golf on the weekends. I'm making things up here. Um, or am I really looking for um, another first generation student, right, who comes from a similar background and experience to me? And that's what we prioritize with within a within a matching um, process. 
connecting with STEM students um, can sometimes be a little bit harder than, than the broader population. Um, and Stephanie, I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, you and your team has done a really wonderful job being intentional about reaching out to, to students. Um, and I'd love if you could provide some of the learnings that you all have um, and, and really making sure to, to bring students into the program, even though it's a, a voluntary opportunity. Correct. And I will mention our university broadly has looked at doing this as a required program, and we pushed back on that for at least for now, because what we've seen is that we are getting high participation rates, and we'll talk about those later with the voluntary participation. And then we have the students who want to be in the program choosing to be in the program. From a recruitment standpoint for our mentees, we start advertising this program to them typically after the May 1st deadline. So once we've had that deposit deadline to come in, we know approximately who's going to be joining us in the fall, we send them the invitation. And this isn't something where it's the first time they've heard about this experience. We talk about our mentor program at every open house we do, at every accepted student event we do. So most of them know that the invitation to join this program is coming. They'll have that email invitation that comes from me inviting them to join this program. The mentor Collective sends follow-up communications on a schedule after that. And we do have the opportunity to also have students receive text messages. We do know that students do not love to read their email even during the onboarding process to a university. So Mentor Collective does have the ability to reach out to the students through text message. We do provide them the student provided number to potentially encourage them in a way that they're actually responding and reading to. If they don't catch us in that first loop, we connect with them at our summer orientation and advising sessions. So that's our second touch point, to try to remind students to join this program. Our third touch point ends up being at our on-campus orientation session the week before classes. And we actually provide the QR code on the screen, tell them to take out their cell phones, begin the sign up process. We can't make them complete the process, but we give them a little bit of time to actually get started on it. And our fourth opportunity is during the first or second week of classes and all of our first year courses within the College of Engineering, both on the intro to computing side and the intro to engineering side, we spend a few minutes talking about why this program is important and how it can help them to succeed. So we're doing this multiple times, but there is a rolling process once they're in the program to do the matching survey, to be matched and start communicating. So we start seeing that the students that are matched early on in the summer they have those conversations in summer. The students that may not get matched until the start of our semester in August or September, they'll start having those conversations at that point as well. And the mentor experience is important to us as well. That's another level of student experience. And, and let's speak to that. Yeah, um, and know that, you know, sense of belonging is also about kind of developing a, a culture of of mentorship and, and care on campus, right? And, and that's really a lot of what we think about um, within the, the mentor experience, right, is, is how do we bring mentees uh, into the program next year as mentors, keep returning mentors in, in, in the program, um, and offer this as a leadership opportunity, right, for rising sophomores and, and juniors in this case to participate in, in the program. Um, we don't want to just throw students into this, right? Um, Mentor Collective uh, works to, to provide a, a training um, for mentors, which talks a lot about how do I have that, that first conversation, right? What does effective mentorship look like? Um, but I always like to call out really importantly, what is not my role as a mentor, right? What do I want to make sure um, a academic advisor or somebody from, uh, you know, the mental health care team can follow up on? Um, and that's where mentors being able to submit flags where they can can raise their hand in a, in a conversation log um, that goes to the institution um, to say, actually, I think it'd be helpful if, if somebody else followed up on this and be able to raise those those early insights um, sooner. So that's part of, of what what mentors um, do. They also um, through their training can can get a certification that can go on their LinkedIn, um, you know, put it on their on their resume. We talk a lot about. Um, how do we recognize mentors for the work that they're doing? A lot of them give back voluntarily because they want to give back to their community. Maybe they had a mentor in their life or didn't. And that is, is one of the reasons why they, they want to give back. Um, but Stephanie, you all have, have done a lot to um, really recognize mentors. There's some questions coming in on, on whether or not mentors are, are paid. In this case, they aren't. Um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about how you've, you've recognized mentors and, and the work that they're doing on campus. 
Yes. Yeah, so our mentors are not paid. They are not receiving academic the credit. They are doing this either because they've had their own positive experience with mentoring and they're choosing to give back or because maybe they wished they had someone to share that experience with. Our pool of mentors comes from the prior year's mentees. So once they've gone through the program, we're very intentional about choosing to invite them to participate. Don't, didn't you have such a positive experience? Don't you want to share that? And we do provide some sort of recognition gifts at a very small level. We have a thank you event with some ice cream and we do give out small gifts to the students. I believe this last year we were giving out solar powered packs with some phrases about thank you for being a charger mentor <laughs> playing on our, um, our, um, excuse me, our mascot and sort of playing on our role as a university. So, you know, it's a little bit cheesy. Um, we did also initiate an annual award for our peer mentoring program where we looked at who was the mentor that was actively engaging with constant conversations and letting us know if there were any issues or maybe there weren't popping up, but just keeping us engaged through the platform metrics that are collected. So we're hoping to, again, build this culture around mentorship within our university. There were a couple of questions about, uh, you know, why do we have peer mentors as well as alumni mentors? And these are for the two different programs. So for the first year program, we have peer mentors, while for the career program, uh, we have alumni mentors. And we'll talk about that a, a little later. Uh, there was also a question about graduate students. We are primarily working with undergraduate students right now, and we have not worked at the graduate level. Yeah. Mentor Collective in general does have programs with graduate students, for the, but for this program at University of New Haven, it's just with our undergraduate population. So moving along those six essentials, you've heard about how this works for that mentor and mentee experience. And then we move to assessment. Uh, we want to look throughout the life of a program. And I know when I was a, an administrator at a university and I ran a mentorship program, it was really all I could do to get matching done and to make sure that some authentic matches happened and wondering what happened with those relationships after. Maybe you could do a little survey or have an event with participants, but to run a program in-house uh, is just not a way to collect meaningful data that can show you the value and that return on investment of mentorship. So that's why we devote so much of our activity at Mentor Collective to assessing the program as we go along. And we do have a tool that our partners can use uh, and that we definitely use behind the scenes, and it's our Mentor Collective Dashboard. What you're looking at right now is what we call our program intelligence chart. And right now we just have a static picture of it, but it is a very interactive tool that our partners use to see where they are in the life cycle of a mentorship program. Uh, it goes from those six essentials start to finish, uh, and it encompasses all the data that we're collecting about the participants participants and their experience in the program. You'll see along the left-hand side of, of the screen is the, the different areas of the dashboard that we can look at. And I'll let Stephanie speak to, uh, you know, how do you interact with this? I know we were talking the other day and you said mostly just when you check in with Austin that you're taking a look at the dashboard, but our partners are able to look at it at any time they'd like. But tell us how you use the dashboard, Stephanie. Yes, so it is something where one of the advantages of this partnership is that a lot of the heavy lifting of the program is done by Mentor Collective because they're doing the matching, because they're doing the assessment, because they've already built in the system to provide a lot of the training and resources. As administrators or facilitators for this program, we don't have to spend a lot of time doing that. The dashboard does provide us that quick glimpse, and as Michelle alluded to, I admitted that Realistically, I don't have time to monitor this every day or even every week. So as a team, we have a call every two weeks and that's usually my prompt to, oh, let me go see what's happening with both of our programs. So it is nice that we have a quick check-in call with the team and that's my, okay, I've got 15 minutes where I'm gonna be talking to this team. Let me make sure I know what's happening with our university because they might be summarizing it as well. It is really nice to give us some trends and you'll see some of the other visuals inside of this later on. So some of the assessment that you're going to see came from analysis we did of our statistics, but some of it also came directly from the dashboard. It has been constantly evolving. It's become more and more useful. So it is great for giving us that snapshot of both of our programs. 
You can see on the right hand side of the screen this at a glance. Um, this is a snapshot of the engagement phase of a program and that's actually the third phase. We start with recruitment and then matching and then engagement. So once the mentors and mentees get matched with each other, they're able to uh, share text messages through uh, an anonymized platform and also report conversations, which is what we ask the mentors to do. Uh, let us know how those conversations are going and you can see the, the high engagement in this program and, and we'll learn about uh, flags in a moment. But let me move to this um, that this trend of from invitation to participation and, and Stephanie, can you, you talk a little bit about these statistics and how we get those? I can, yes. So we did already clarify that this is an opt-in program. And the analysis that you're seeing is from the first two years of operation. It does not have our fall numbers on there because we're still in the thick of getting things up and running for the semester. So we haven't repeated any of this analysis yet. But we can see the number of invited students. The difference between our 20 and 21 was our 21 included all potential accepted students. So it was a little bit larger, not necessarily that they were all going to end up joining our university. And then on the mentor side, you can see that we're inviting a large number of students, which is mostly our sophomore class and some of our juniors to serve as mentors. The new graphic that you see appear on the right are what we call our funnels. And this was something that Mentor Collective launched within the last year, which has made it really easy for us, instead of looking at tables like this, to understand where we are in the process. So we can see the total number of individuals who were invited into that specific role, how many have clicked through to do the registration process. The matching survey is on both sides. The mentors then have to sign up and complete the training. So those are additional steps and then the matched. Now, mentors that have been in the program before do not have to redo the training. Um, we know that that would be an unnecessary burden. So that's why at that bottom funnel, you do see that is a little bit larger than just the completed training. Those are the returning your mentors and any of the new mentors coming in. But our main takeaway is when you do an opt-in program, you will not have full participation rates. Um, it is something where maybe we would love to see that, and we'll talk about how that might influence the analysis, but these are students who are choosing to participate in both of these roles. Thank you. And then let's take a look at some highlights of these statistics between uh, 20 and 21. Yeah, so the column that you see in yellow, when we publish this, we realize this is going to stand out. And so we want to take it a minute to talk about when we're working with our students, we are generally seeing some high participation and engagement rates. And when we look at that career mentor program, I want to remind you that for the way our program is set up, those were industry alumni or industry partners at organizations that we have relationships with that were sent an explicit invitation. So again, this is something where we do provide Mentor Collective a list of everyone that we are planning to invite as a mentor. We send the initial communication out. They will send the follow-up. But because these are individuals who may not have engaged with us recently, our alumni may or may not have been in contact. They may or may not be local at this point. We do some filtering to try to have a meaningful group that would choose to be. We see that our mentor transition for the career program, again, from alumni and professionals is a much lower rate. So you will need, if you're looking for this external audience, potentially a much larger pool than if you were doing an internal pool. Whereas our student mentors, we still have maybe not as high as we would like with our rates. We still have strong enough numbers to support our program. If we invited only that on our industry side, we probably wouldn't have enough to support our program. And, and one, with, oh, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, and with the alumni and mentors, I was going to say, we try to keep them on the younger side. So within 10 years of graduation so that they can, uh, you know, they're still advancing in their careers and they can relate to the students more closely as well. And one uh, statistic that I love to share is that from the, the first year of the program to the second year for our peer mentors, more than 87% of the students who participated as mentees went on to become mentors. And uh, part of that I think was, and, and we have talked about this uh, as a team, but that the impact of, of COVID and, and wanting that uh, some kind of interaction with someone when we were all uh, online and virtual, that those numbers are changing a little bit with engagement, but that in any regard is an amazing uh, return and that creation of that culture of mentorship for the, the students who were mentees wanting to become mentors. 
So these next couple slides are not as pretty. Uh, in all honesty, these were from our paper and don't have the mentor collective graphic and look, but uh, they do showcase who was choosing to be a mentee. And on our next slide, it will showcase who was choosing to be a mentor. So on this slide, you see the breakdown by gender as well as by ethnicity. And these percentages of who is choosing approximately represent the demographics in our college. Um, the one thing that we did see is that we had quite a large amount of unreported ethnicity, uh, race or ethnicity, and that's because it's not required. We technically could have fed that in from our university systems, but that adds another layer, and even our university systems don't have full transparency with the demographic information. So we are seeing some good participation across the overall number of students who were invited. You can see that the participation in our career program has been at first high and then low. We've seen a little bit of the disengagement with our students as our juniors and seniors were maybe more emphasizing their academics and not thinking about career as they went through these two years of COVID. While our first year rates increased, we had 73, close to 73% of our students eligible for the first year program participating last year. On the next slide, you'll see the mentor piece. And again, on the mentor piece, it's important to keep in mind that our first year mentors are the mentors that are representing our student body and the career mentors, which are gonna be the two right bars on all of these sets of four, are representing our industry partners and our industry alumni. So while our females are mentoring at slightly higher rates than the college body that we have, we do see a drop in the career female representation we can hypothesize that potentially that is due to the pandemic burdens on our female partners in industry. We know there was some research showing that additional burdens added that their male peers did not, but we didn't dive into that ourselves. We did not reach out and survey. We still had enough mentors, just maybe not the right diversity of mentors we would have liked to see to align with our student body. And similarly, even for our mentors, we see a significant percentage of unreported race and ethnicity, because again, this is not linking into our university database for that piece. I want to talk a little about on-demand mentor training. So this is an innovation that our team uh, developed in the past year. Uh, in previous iterations of our program over the last eight years or so, we've been offering live training uh, via a virtual format, but with a live trainer uh, and students had to to sign up or mentors had to sign up for a particular time slot to participate in training. And we have been able to develop an on-demand training that is a series of uh, modules that our mentors can uh, participate in in their time. Uh, so it's whenever they have the time to do it. And once they uh, become onboarded, complete that matching survey, they're immediately invited to start the training process. Usually it takes about an hour for our mentors to complete the online training, but there are checks for understanding. Uh, we had a question in the chat about what do you train about? And we provided a link to, so you can get more detailed information about our training. But what you can see here is that through that series of modules, we're working on skill development. So it's not just about how to use the the mentor collective system and how to get into the system and report conversations, that's an important component. But the more important component is how to be a great mentor. So understanding the role of a mentor and the difference between being maybe a mentor or a tutor or a peer advisor, those are all different kinds of roles that a mentor might have. And we want our mentors to know this is how we define mentorship and how you can work best with your student. We also continue that online learning opportunities for our mentors mentors through what we call discussion guides. So right now there are more than 45 different topics that are available in, at any time to our mentors on topics related to being a good mentor and guiding conversations in, in different situations. And we also work with our partners to create campus-based materials for our mentors as well. And those can also be loaded into the system that the mentors can access. 
Now we're on to what I think is a, a keystone of what we do at Mentor Collective, and that's that flag system, the early alert flags that mentors can file. And what um, is great about our team at University of New Haven is they have a dedicated faculty member who works on these. And Nadia, I'm happy to hear from you about how you work with the flags in the Mentor Collective system. Yes, so you're right. I mean, this is one of the best parts of the platform that we have, not only that, you know, they have conversations, you pair them up, um, they log in their conversations, but being able to raise a flag uh, when a mentor sees a need uh, and for us to be able to see that is a great opportunity to be able to provide more resources when it's needed. Um, so the way that we look at this, um, there is a system uh, when uh, after a conversation, if the mentor chooses to do so, they can go in and put in a flag. Uh, in the current system and the uh, upgrade, which is nice, uh, there are priority categories. So a flag can be raised as just so that you know, you know, support not needed, or you know what, this is really something important. You really should, you know, do something about it. Um, so having those categories is nice too. So what we do is when a flag is raised, um, of course we look at what it is, but that category is very important too. Uh, with the ones they say it's the assistance would be good. Uh, we reach out to the mentor. Uh, and we provide them the resources related to the flag that they raised. And so one of the resources just you mentioned um, under the resources tab, there are several guides that are specifically tailored for University of New Haven. Uh, and it provides more um, resources that are available on campus um, for a particular subject. Um, so we definitely make sure that the mentors are available, that those are there. And we also um, you know, provide more information if more is available than what's on that um, stand, um, standard ones. And we also ask them uh, if um, you know, it would be nice for the university to step in. Uh, and maybe intervene and provide more resources, but we never put that into action uh, until we get a confirmation that it, that's something that mentee would like to have. Um, so we kind of uh, keep that privacy out there. We provide it as an option. Uh, and throughout the years that we use the platform, there were some cases where the mentee came back and said, yeah, that would be very nice if I can get more help on this. So in that case, we take the flag and we put it, uh, we do have another internal system where uh, there are many offices that are connected uh, and uh, work as a group to provide support to the students who are in need of support. Um, so we move the flag to that system and then it's processed within um, our system. Thank you. And one one advantage that we have through the dashboard is I think, Nadia, the way you do it, you're manually entering that flag information into your other system. But when we have a large volume of flags uh, with some of our programs, we actually have an export feature where we can export the flag data uh, into a CSV file and then it can be imported into other systems that our campus partners might use. So when we go ahead on this? Yeah, sure. This yeah. Is, and this is the topics of the flags. Right. It was, it was, it was part of um, uh, what we discussed in the paper as well. Um, so these are the most common uh, topics that we've seen uh, with the flags that were raised. Uh, and nothing was a surprise, right? I mean, when you think about the students, uh, and if you look at the ones that belongs to the first year versus that belongs to the career, uh, you see where the conversations go or where the flags are raised. Um, academic related issues is common to all, although it's um, maybe a little bit more for the first year students, but uh, things related to finding jobs, finding internships are more on the career side. Uh, but as I said before, uh, these were not a surprise, but it is nice to see, you know, um, the pattern that you expect things that are going on uh, is what is actually taking place. Uh, and just a comment on this, when the paper came out, um, we were still mid-21. Uh, so, uh, you know, that might be a reason why the 20 uh, flags are a lot higher than 21. So uh, mm -hmm. all of the other uh, charts that we have seen, those were about participation. So they were about, you know, uh, the right numbers, but uh, these only show half of 21. Mm, great point. And looking more at what those students are discussing. Uh, 
the the percentage and uh, those first year students and what they're talking about. And Stephanie, would you say that this informs your work and uh, in coming up with programming for your students and different interventions? I think it, it does, right? We know that, especially in the last few years, the types of engagement that students have been having, the types of conversations, we didn't know where things were going. Is everyone always talking about COVID or are they having those other conversations that's still about academics? Is it still about trying to connect? So with our first year program, it's not surprising to see that some of those top three topics that we see are the academics, school life, and getting to know each other. The other is the catch-all, so it's sometimes hard to know what they're talking about in that other category, but I think this is something where we have tried to plan events for the students in our mentorship program. We typically do one in the fall as a kickoff, come get to know each other, sometimes by itself, sometimes in collaboration with other university programming. And in the spring, we typically have a closeout event. So this is a good chance for us to try to bring the students together in person because these mentor-mentee pairs can be communicating via email, via text message, via maybe meeting up in person, but trying to have an opportunity for them to connect in person can help get them past some of the surface level conversations into the deeper conversations about resources they might be looking for, about sense of belonging, those deeper level pieces. On the another, next slide, oh, go ahead. Yeah, another feature of our, our dashboard is that we're able to collect rich qualitative data from the participants. Both the mentors and mentees are able to provide open-ended responses uh, where every time they're reporting a conversation, we're surveying them and asking them for additional information about their experience. And that's where the quotes that uh, you'll see on these slides came from. That's when we're constantly asking the students uh, the mentors and the mentees about their experience uh, in the program. In this next slide just shows the similar type of data, the career, oh, the career Sorry. program piece though. So on our career program, again, these topics can be reported by either the mentor or the mentee. It's not coming from just one or the other. So we do see that uh, quite a big piece of this is getting to know each other, there's still a conversation about academics, but we start to see some other conversations taking place we don't typically see at the first year program, like networking, discussing grad school, discussing interviews, or these other resources we typically link inside of a career readiness mentorship program. And what have you learned um, beyond just these conversation topics and as Nadia uh, alluded to it was no surprise you know these things are happening but uh, how do you move from anecdotal to verified this is what's happening with our students and and uh, has there been anything else that you've learned about your students through the data that uh, is collected through the program I'll take this one I think one of the challenges we sometimes ha have is when we do see students with concerns before the system was in place. They were typically popping up from maybe a student email that gets sent out or a faculty alert that someone sends us and we're running it through an internal system to try to get them the appropriate resources to solve that challenge. Inside of this platform because of the flag system because of the conversation systems, we can put a quantification to some of those pieces. How many of our students are bringing up financial issues? How many of our students are feeling like they're isolated or how many are struggling academically? So as a college, we can discuss some of these bigger pieces. None of it was too surprising, but it gives us a little bit of leverage when working with the other university offices to say, these are what our College of Engineering students need right now. Wonderful. And these are the leading indicators of success that you see on this slide. This is how we are able to show our partners what's happening with the program, both in real time and then through some cumulative review halfway through and at the end of each program year. So you're able to see trends and see what happens between participation. Uh, one trend that we noticed in the career program was that although the number of participants changed from 20 to 21 in the career program, engagement went way up. So we had 60% of our participants engaged in that three or more conversations in 2021 with our career program. But we can see this. And then we also have these measures of sense of belonging and self-efficacy with our programs that we're doing. But then we partner with 
our institutions uh, where they can do some of their own research as well. Uh, but partnering on research, partnering on looking at the data in a deeper way to learn more about that student experience and showing those indicators of student success uh, directly related to mentorship. And the big question, does it impact retention? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I was, we were very interested in determining this because obviously, uh, you know, there are some uh, resource costs in running the program. And so we wanted to get a quick uh, assessment of whether it was working. So this is based only on the first year data, which is from 20 to 21. Um, and so during the summer, we were able to, uh, uh, for the paper, actually, during the early spring, we were able to collect this data. Uh, and this shows, so because it was a voluntary program, we have students who participated and those who did not. Uh, we call them the those who refrained from participating. Um, and we looked at the first year retention, uh, both within the College of Engineering as well as at the university. So if they're transferred out of the college, but stayed at the university, that was still considered retention within the university. Uh, and so what we see here, uh, the good news is that all the gray bars, uh, which are for the, the proportions for students who participated are higher than the black bars. Uh, but having said that, uh, from a, we also uh, conducted uh, statistical uh, comparisons uh, of these differences. And those that have the green box around them, those are the ones which were statistically significant. So retention at the university level went up from 69 to 82%, that was statistically significant. And for female students, retention both within the college and within the university, you can see those big changes there uh, among students who participated versus those who did not. Uh, and those uh, were statistically significant. So wow. these were the numbers on the gender side. Uh, and similarly, when we look at the race ethnicity, ethnicity side, uh, you can see that the biggest impact here was among uh, black students, uh, retention both within the College of Engineering as well as retention within the university, very high numbers for those who participated compared to those who did not. Uh, some of these numbers are a little misleading. So you can see in the Asian category, we had very few students with just a handful of students uh, who participated in the study. So they had shown sort of a reverse trend. Uh, it's not statistically significant, but again, I think it's normally because of the very small number of students who are of Asian background who participated in the program. And some more of the student voice, uh, finding out about uh, that experience from the mentors and the mentees, uh, navigating college life, uh, getting to know each other, uh, the mentor offering those different strategies on success. These are all parts of that mentoring experience that we see. So is it worth it to run a large scale, high capacity mentorship program? Yeah, we feel at this point in time that it is worth it. Uh, now I should mention that uh, the launch of this program for these first uh, you know, three years has been supported by Lockheed, a grant from Lockheed Martin. Uh, so we are thankful for that and we should acknowledge their support. Uh, but going forward, you know, if we don't have uh, external uh, grant support to sustain this program, uh, the question of the university level is, uh, should we be spending our own uh, funds on running such a program? Uh, and in my sense, I think it is worth it. And you can do some calculations in terms of the increased revenue to the institution when retention uh, increases or improves. Uh, and, you know, our uh, early indications are that, uh, you know, the increased revenue from the retention successes will more than offset the cost of running the program. So certainly uh, at the first year level, we feel that it is very worthwhile uh, having this program and having it uh, being able to scale it uh, at the level that uh, we are doing, which would not be possible, I don't think, with, uh, without the partnership with Meta Collective. So, uh, you know, no question about that. 
Uh, at the career level, at the, at the career program, uh, success is a little bit harder to measure because we don't have those quantified numbers like retention and so on. What we have found is that alumni really enjoy uh, working with students and mentoring them. And so there is an alumni engagement piece, which is sort of a side effect, if you uh, like, of the program. Uh, which is beneficial from a number of points. I mean, uh, we always like to keep our alumni engaged with the college. And so this is a program that helps in that. Uh, and students who participated certainly, you know, have commented favorably about it, but those are more anecdotal. Uh, and we will work harder to try to quantify uh, some of the successes in, in the career program uh, going forward. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Ron. We actually at Mentor Collective, we've been working on that as well to make sure that we do have those outcomes that we can measure uh, with our career readiness programs. So uh, we're happy to work on that as we move forward into the future with uh, the 2022-23 uh, program that we're about to launch. Uh, so we have a poll for you. Do you want to learn more uh, for your own organization, your own campus about scaling mentorship at your institution? So if you would like to hear from us uh, for a conversation with Mentor Collective, please respond to the poll. And we're happy to speak more with you about the impact of mentorship and how it might work at your institution. So we do have some time for Q&A. We've had some great questions in the chat. Uh, we do have some questions about cost. Uh, we typically structure our cost uh, with a partnership fee with an institution, and then we have a, a sliding scale based on the number of matches, so the scale of the program. But all of that is based on the desired outcomes that you have, what kind of program you'll be running on your campus, and how you want the impact to be measured. So we work on pricing with our partners uh, in a variety of ways, and, and we're happy to discuss that with you. But as Ron showed, there's definite return on investment. Even just if, the, if you're able to retain even just a few students each year, you're able to more than cover the cost of a mentor collective program. And I'm going to ask my uh, colleagues, were there any other questions that you think we did not get to today from the chat? There was a question, I think I, I caught it, uh, about first uh, generation students uh, and, you know, what the numbers were. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we don't track that information very well at the university, so we did not focus in on that because we did not have good background information on exactly uh, which students were first gen students. Uh, so that that's a problem at the university level. We just need to be able to uh, get that information uh, more accurately. Thank you for that, Ron. Thank you. And we do work um, with First generation students is a population that we do work with with a number of campuses and actually if you look through our mentor collective blog I think you'll find some great resources from some of our other partners whose programs are specifically geared to first gen uh, both campus wide and in specific disciplines so I encourage you to take a look at the mentor collective website to learn more about the impact on first generation students. We also love to present at conferences. As I mentioned, this was a presentation at the ASEE conference that our UNH partners did uh, to share their results. We are coming up on conference season for uh, lots of our partners, and we will be all over the country at uh, North Carolina. Uh, we're presenting with UNC Greensboro at the New Mexico Mentoring Institute. We will be at the CCAS Dean's Gathering in Washington, DC. We'll be at the ACRO meeting uh and to have a booth there and we will be at the ueru conference as well so we hope that you will uh, join us if you're on the road at a conference uh, come check out mentor collective and our presentations and then if you would like more information about the research that university of new haven did we have some contact information here from our partners so you feel free to contact them directly or work with us at mentor collective and we'll get you the information that you you need so thank you so much for joining us today. Do we have any other questions? Feel free to put those in the chat. But I think we have ended right on time. So great to see everyone today. Thank you so much for your participation and thank you for your interest in Mentor Collective and very great applause to our University of New Haven partners for the great work that you do for your students.
Thank you. Have a wonderful day.